Hello and welcome to Politics at Jack and Sam's Daily, the podcast which gives you everything you need for the day ahead in British politics in under 20 minutes. It is Tuesday, December the 10th. My name is Jack Blanchard of Politico. With me, as you can hear, is Sam Coates of Sky News. How are you doing, Sam? Very good. Christmas might be two weeks tomorrow, but the Prime Minister's out of the country, not, I suspect, for the final time this year. And Rachel Reeves, the Chancellor, seems to be readying plans to run it in his place for the next six months because she is launching her spending review. Um, We've also got the fallout from events in Syria, which will be dominating the news uh, today, even though we've pivoted back to domestic matters to start with. Uh, So it's a busy old day uh, in this mid-December morning. You've just completely scrambled my head there by telling me Christmas is two weeks tomorrow. Oh, my God, how did that happen? Right, OK, that'll give me something to think about through the day, along with the spending review. Yeah, um, we were fl- flagging this yesterday. This, the spending review is officially launched today. Sam, why don't you just start off by explaining to our listeners what a spending review actually is? I remember arriving in uh, in, in Whitehall as a, as a political journalist and being very excited about budgets and a little confused about spending reviews. But all the really clever journalists seem to realise that spending reviews are actually more important than a budget. Just just talk us through exactly what this process is and why it matters so much. Well, all across Whitehall today, uh, letters from the number two in the Treasury, Darren Jones, will arrive with a thud uh, on the desk of Secretaries of State, announcing that between now and June, which is when we're told this uh, spending review is, a little bit later than we thought, uh, that the Treasury will be combing through all of their books in order to work out how much money to give every department. The way that basically government accounting works is the Treasury holds the purse strings, it works out the overall amount of money it wants to spend, uh, and then it allocates them by department. Each department on this occasion and this spending review for the first time since 2007 will have to justify every single line of spending, we are told, right down to individual projects worth millions in order to continue to have them funded by the centre. It is the way that the UK Treasury maintains a near unparalleled grip on the political process in a way that I don't really think happens anywhere else in the Western world. It means that Rachel Reeves continues to be the most power, uh, powerful figure uh, in the government for good or for ill, because these processes put her and her chief secretary, Darren Jones, right at the start of it. You might think that cabinet ministers hold the power Jack and the other members of the cabinet uh, amount to much. In a spending review period, they all have to kneel before Rachel Reeves, present their plans and be told yes or more likely no, uh, because in this spending review, things are very, very tight. Yeah, it's, it, it's an enormous piece of work that is being demanded of government departments, although some would say an important one because obviously um, people don't like to see money being wasted, but you can't imagine how much time is being spent putting it into a process like this. Crucially, Sam, we're told that uh, they are going to be asked to find efficiency savings from their budgets of 5%. doesn't sound like an enormous figure uh, in the abstract, but it actually is quite an enormous figure when you're going through your department's budgets line by line, uh, as you say, and it all adds up to quite quite a lot of taxpayers' money. The reason that she's doing that. One is to make, you know, try and send out the message that Labour is not this sort of profligate, you know, happy, spendy, loves just throwing away taxpayers' money sort of operation. Um, And they obviously want that message to filter through to the public. And by the way, I did note, Sam, in the press release that we got overnight from the Treasury about the start of this process, Rachel Reeves is quoted as saying she wants to wield an iron fist against waste. I mean, this is someone who's leaning into the Margaret Thatcher thing harder than just about any Tory chancellor we've had over the last uh, 14 years. I find it rather amusing. But anyway, um, she, they, they, they obviously want to get this message out that she is there to you know not, not, not waste taxpayers' money. But also because she, as we've said before on this podcast, she has this enormous spending crunch coming down the track, right? We know from the plans that we saw announced in the budget um, earlier in the year that the initial sort of big borrowing and, and spending plans that Rachel Reeves announced only really last for the next year or two. And after that, there is a big problem coming down the track for Britain's public services. So efficiency savings 
or cuts or whatever you want to describe them as are absolutely essential um, if if uh, we're going to find any way of balancing the budget in the latter half of this parliament without coming back and asking for big more tax hikes, which Rachel Reeves has sort of said she's not going to do, and then sort of backtracked a bit and not quite said she's not going to do, but they're obviously very keen not to do that if they can possibly help it. Rachel Reeves in the budget in October spent £60 billion. In effect, she maxed out the credit card. She did the maximum amount of borrowing, really, that the markets will allow. And there was a small adjustment, a, a, you know, a small increase immediately after the budget in the cost of Britain's debt. And that was the markets signalling, you know, you've, you've reached your limit on that. Uh, she thinks that in, in in big picture terms, she's taxing near to what the maximum is that she can do. So they've allocated money, they've spent the money. But there are two big problems. First of all, that the plans between now and 2030, which is when uh, this spending review will pretty much take us up to, uh, are, are not enough even to keep pace with inflation in some bits of Whitehall. The Office for Budget Responsibility suggested uh, that... From 2025 onwards, uh, all the way up to 2029, uh, you're going to have to find an extra £7 billion just to keep uh, pace uh, with inflation. Um, And then the second thing, Jack, that makes this spending review so hard is that uh, even if you keep budgets broadly the same, from within that, you've got to find £10.5 billion pounds to spend on the military to get defence spending up to 2.5% of GDP, if that remains the aim. We'll find out in the uh, Strategic Defence Review early next year. You're going to have to find billions for social care unless you abandon that. And there are already some people who think that this government is going to abandon any wholesale reform of social care. Um, uh, and then you've got to find billions more to actually do the NHS reforms uh, that West Streeting has talked about, you know, that switch from hospitals to communities, which will cost a lot of money because you'll have to have two different services running in parallel while you make uh, those switch. So there's an awful lot of appetite uh, for more money needed. Um, the, the sort of big picture is that Rachel Reeves has ended up doing, in some ways, uh, spending in this parliament the reverse of the way that we normally do it. Normally, there is uh, a big review into some area of policy reform. uh, And then as it's concluding, the Treasury give a lump of cash to pay for the cost of reforms because reforms being changed and that is often expensive. But in this parliament, Rachel Reeves is effectively setting the overall budgets and then requiring everybody to find money from within that if they want to do something. And that is going to make this entire parliament really fraught when it comes to finding cash. So every single cabinet minister is readying themselves for a fight with the budget. They already find uh, Rachel Reeves's treasury pretty inflexible. The actual accusation uh, that you now hear whispered around Whitehall is that she doesn't have enough of a grip on the treasury machine who just... (sighs) Uh, apply the same old orthodoxy, the same old caution uh, uh, that they always have done without there being enough politics at the top of the Treasury to actually deliver, for instance, manifesto promises that actually some think are going to be broken. And uh, as a consequence, uh, they worry uh, about, you know, this government not really doing what it promised uh, the public. The Treasury would say, well, it needs to be very careful with public money. So there's a right old battle uh, coming off the back of a bruising period for Rachel Reeves. Um, But it really puts her at the centre of events because... Let's be honest, although Keir Starmer was involved with the budget more than he was with that uh, that first fiscal statement in July, he, he doesn't tinker with every single detail. Uh, he still remains, according to one person I was talking to, a bit more chairman uh, than chief executive. So uh, it is Horse Guards Parade in the Treasury building that's going to be at the centre of events for the next six months, enabling lots of time for trips out of the country, perhaps. Yeah, they'll certainly be at the centre of events today with Keir Starmer away. I think it's Rachel Reeves' face that'll be uh, popping up on the news. She and Darren Jones are, are, are doing some media this morning and they've headed off to um, some sort of hospital or, or what they're calling a healthcare environment for, for, for a, a clip with um, with workers there. And that's part of this idea of uh, Darren Jones being dispatched to look closely at, at frontline services in person to try and see where some of these efficiency savings can be found. I'm not quite sure that sending in the sort of government minister to go and hang around in the corner for a day is quite how you find the uh, the key savings to our public service you need but it's all, it's all rather performative isn't it but nevertheless that is apparently happening so we'll see that and Rachel Reeves is doing some um, 
some broadcast interviewing today as well. So she'll we'll we'll hear a lot from her. One of one of the things that they are doing, Sam, or that they are keen to talk about is that they're bringing in um, private sector executives to help with this process. They're saying that they're bringing in uh, former senior managers from big banks and uh, academics who may know a thing or two about cost cutting to come in and look at this. Quite how effective that will be versus the Whitehall machine remains to be seen. But interestingly, it's actually the, the approach that Donald Trump is taking over in the US, sort of, isn't it? Because he, he is bringing in, of course, Elon Musk in what they're calling a department for government efficiency. Oh, good, good goodness, no. What's going on in the UK is a piece of trivial flimflam. Uh, it is a headline for a press release. Uh, I doubt that these private sector figures, these bankers, will have the slightest impact on the spending review whatsoever. There'll be one headline now. There'll be one headline in a few months. It is completely different to Elon Musk. And frankly, I thought that line uh, was a bit of a joke, and I will not be convinced unless I get hard evidence otherwise. I mean, I think that's very, very cynical of you, Sam. I mean, Elon Musk is planning to cut the entire US government by like a third or something like that, which is exactly what he did at Twitter. I'm sure that these random former managers of Lloyds Bank will be planning something similar in DEFRA, don't you think? I was hearing <laughs> civil servants, not political advisors, civil servants railing against Treasury orthodoxy and the fact that they are the most stubborn of government departments when it comes to assessing what amounts to growth or not a few days ago. Uh, they complain uh, that the way that the Treasury measures growth is so narrow that you can't get decent projects off the ground and they don't think that Rachel Rees has got a grip of it. Now, in her conference speech... Actually, Rachel Reeves tilted into the idea that she's going to reform the Treasury and the Treasury's way of thinking. There was a line in her conference speech, but people say they haven't seen any evidence of that really being true since. Um, and they question the extent of the political grip on the institution. In fact, they say she leans into the orthodoxy because, you know, there was that row about whether or not she was an economist at uh, HSBC when she worked there. You know, the complaint I'm picking up is that she's way too much of, economi of an economist and not enough of a politician in these processes. So Rachel Reeves should be less economist uh, is a view that you get around Whitehall incredibly. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it, that um, you often hear former chancellors talk about this and how they'll come into the job. And it's obviously an enormous job. We haven't done anything like it, but nobody's done anything like it before. And they come in and they'll they'll you see that the Treasury officials pulling out of the draw sort of this and that old project that they'd tried to run past a previous chancellor who'd said no to it and sort of whip it through with a new one because so often these things just get nodded through if you're if you're new to the job and you know there is a theory that sometimes you need an outside disruptor like Elon Musk or dare I say or someone like that who could come in and take a very very different approach to these things Rachel Reeves uh, however many uh, former bankers she might be advised by is clearly not that sort of figure right it's just not going to take a radical approach with the uh, with the government department you're right. There's meant to be an outside force that balances the Treasury. And it's called number 10. Number 10 is meant to be the political brain that oversees and keeps tabs on the Treasury. But as we discussed before the budget, there just do not appear to be big political economic brains in number 10. Big figures who are, you know, you know keeping the rule over everything the Treasury is doing. Um, and kind of keeping a second eye on that for the Prime Minister. That that bit doesn't seem to be working, and that is worrying bits of Whitehall. Let's talk about number 10, because Keir Starmer is not in there today. He is over in Cyprus, where uh, he is making the first visit by a UK Prime Minister to the island since, I think, 1971. That's already kicked things off over there, because the uh, Turkish Cypriot leader is not happy, demanding equal footing, um, uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, uh, given the politics of that. But nevertheless, this is part of Starmer's trip to the Middle East. As we know, he was in the Gulf yesterday, and this is all in the context, of course, of the revolution that has happened in uh, in Syria over the last few days, Sam, uh, and obviously that will be top of the list for Keir Starmer to be discussing with uh, with the Cyprus's president, whose name I'm not even going to try and pronounce on this podcast. Um, Downing Street saying Starmer's not going to be doing any media today, but he will be addressing uh, British troops because, uh, uh, of course, we have bases in Cyprus, which is the main reason for the visit. Um, the Syria conflict is on pretty much every front page this morning, hardly surprising given the scale and the, the importance of it. 
And we're still seeing the reverberations in the UK, obviously dominated conversation in the UK yesterday, Sam. Um, this debate about how the UK government should deal with uh, HTS, the, uh, the, 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 the sort of leading rebel group in the revolution, continues to be discussed. The British government seemed to sort of slightly walk back uh, through yesterday. The day started with Pat McFadden, the uh, cabinet office minister, suggesting there could be a, some movement on whether we treat HDS as a terrorist group. Uh, uh, some movement on that in the current days by later in the afternoon, Downing Street was suggesting that might be less likely. I'm very interested to see how America deals with this because you feel like uh, the US lead on this is probably where European nations will follow uh, and my Politico colleagues in D.C. this morning are reporting there is a big debate happening in Washington right now about how they deal with this new rebel group that's pretty much in charge of uh, key parts of Syria. Uh, they're quoting one government official saying there's a huge scramble to see if and how and when we can delist HTS. And you'd imagine, Sam, that if America makes a big move on that, it'll probably be coordinated with other Western allies, uh, including Britain, rather than, you know, Keir Starmer, you know, radically going out on a limb on this. You'd think this would be something there all talking about amongst themselves and that we'll get some sort of decision fairly quickly on whether these guys are the goodies or the baddies uh, over the next few days and weeks. I thought Keir Starmer's instinct to push back any decision from kind of imminent to medium to long term was quite smart because reading all the coverage in, in Syria and watching my colleagues, my brave, brave colleagues in Sky News uh, who are out and around in the country, it is quite clear that nobody knows how or even whether Syria is going to be able to be governed in a relatively stable way or whether that country is facing the same kind of horror that, you know, befell Iraq after the invasion by the US uh, and the UK uh, 20 odd years ago. Um, it is not clear whether that group that has taken over uh, will be stable and have authority, uh, or whether we could have bits of Syria that turn back into a terrorist group, or indeed some of the people that have taken over. So you, you can't really judge how this lot are going to behave because they don't know the situation, even as all the jails are flung open, um, people of all stripes are, are, are released, uh, and you can see security services and security service sources and, and former intelligence officials you know, raising all sorts of alarm bells over uh, what might happen inside the country and the consequences for migration, people leaving. There was a second big decision by the UK yesterday, and that was one sort of later in the day, which was to suspend all Syrian asylum claims. Uh, this claim, uh, this was a Home Office decision. It came while David Lammy, the Foreign Secretary, was on his feet in the Commons, sort of suggesting that they weren't about to do this. Uh, but there are now not going to be any Syrian asylum uh, claims processed for entry into the UK. Now, that means, apart from anything else, uh, that 6,502 Syrians who are awaiting a decision on their asylum claim, uh, most of whom arrived in the past 12 months, are now paused. Syrian asylum claims, like 99% of people who come from Syria uh, were being given asylum. That is now being paused. You know, figures like Tory Robert Jenner are saying, well, that's because they can go back. Others, I'm sure, will say, well, we don't really know what's going on in Syria at the moment. That That's a pretty bold claim. Uh, but other Western European nations are doing the same and saying it's just too early to say and we don't want to be a safe haven for millions and millions of, of Syrians suddenly now deciding to leave the country. It is a very big dilemma involving the country that I would say sort of kick-started the global mass migration crisis in 20, 2011 um, uh, and began the procession of people moving in huge numbers, uh, in some senses inculcated uh, the sort of beginnings of the industrialization of people smuggling. Uh, and now we could see a big new wave coming. And so that's why the UK and other countries have acted so precipitously. Or, or equally, we could see a, a sort of wave moving in the other direction. I mean, you're seeing on TV and you're reading, I'm sure, in the papers, these reports, lots and lots of displaced Syrians excitedly saying, finally, this is the chance I've got to go back to my home country. And, and lots of people obviously hoping that that's how this is going to pan out. Um, but as we were saying yesterday, it was just far too early to know how stable the new regime is going to be, how possible that's going to be for lots of these people. But it's clearly in lots of Syrians' minds that this is you know, the chance they've been waiting for to 
to go back to their country. And you can see the discussions happening, particularly in countries like Germany, which took in huge amounts of Syrian refugees, as you'll obviously remember, uh, in the 2010s. Um, the, 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 the direction of people movement as a re result of what's happened over the last couple of weeks is really unclear. Um, it's just likely that there will be big movements of people. And that, of course, is a very, very political thing when it happens. And we know that the ramifications of that can be huge for Western democracy. Um, so we'll just have to wait and see, won't we, which way this one's going to go. A lot of these things will be discussed at a Cali Group meeting in the UK, which is the Home Affairs Ministers of the UK, and Germany, uh, Netherlands, European Commission, some agencies. So this is on the agenda in Britain, uh, in, I believe, London, but that's all we've got time for. We'll be back here tomorrow morning for the day ahead on Wednesday. And Keir Starmer will be back too for a brief jaunt to Britain. We'll look forward to seeing him and if he can see you then. Cheers. See you then. Bye.